Okay, uh, today we will finish the clean Gordon part and then start with the um, uh, <coughs> direct uh, equation. Well, the, um, the part that we will do now is the coupling of the clean Gordon equation with an electromagnetic field well, you have learned <coughs> well an electromagnetic field we will give uh, by giving uh, um, four potential it has a um, time part and a space part, and this is A0, AX, AY, AZ, okay? Or otherwise, if you want to use the metric and bring the index down, then you have A0 minus A, because of the minus one in the metric, you get that this Well, the value is the same, but there is this different sign. Now, which is, uh, <coughs> if there is a, an electromagnetic field, how do, you, um, how do we uh, couple it? Well, we use uh, the same trick you have used uh, you have used uh, in the Schrodinger equation. That means the minimal coupling. And... Uh, the minimal coupling means, well, what is the analog of the energy of the derivative with respect to time goes into I H D D T minus E A zero e is the electric charge. And what is the momentum goes into minus I H the gradient minus E over C I. So this is the minimal coupling scheme. And um, we can write this, uh, if you remember, uh, as a four vector notation, P mu, that goes into P mu minus E C A mu. Okay. And uh, let's remember that P zero is equal to E over C. So all the right factor goes in the right place. Now, <coughs> this minimal uh, coupling scheme works. Now let's take the let's take the um, uh, Klein Gordon equation. That was this, and let's uh, now turn on the electromagnetic field. Then with this uh, substitution you get um, that it goes into P mu minus E C A mu P mu minus E C A mu C equal M zero C square Psi. Now, on what is it, one can ask, um, uh, on what is based these minimal coupling things? Well, it's based only on the fact that it works. But later on, we will see also there is uh, another reason related to gauge invariance. But uh, let's say it works. So now if we, this is the operatorial form of the klein gordon equation. If we replace the P mu, the derivative with respect to time for pi zero, and the derivative with respect to x for the other, what we get is the following things. One over C square, I over H, D, D, T, minus E, a zero square psi equal, let's bring this, uh, the space part on the other side, you get I H plus E C A square plus M zero C square. Psi. Now, so this is the form of the equation 
where of the klein gordon equation when you have an electromagnetic field? Well, you know that this part uh, is related via his uh, rotor to the uh, magnetic field. Uh, how is related, to what is related this? Well, um, the usual convention is that E times E0 is the potential, the electric potential that you use to derive the electric field. The gradient of that V is the electric field and is related to the time component in this uh, manner. Now, <clears throat> okay, so this minimal coupling works and um, uh, that uh, would be sufficient, but there is another <clears throat> important um, things that we should consider that is gauge invariance. Um, we know that the electric and the magnetic field don't change if we change, uh, can I cancel here? You know that the electric and magnetic field, that after all are the observable quantity, don't change if we do a gauge transformation. The gauge transformation is something like this, that we change the gauge potential in the following manner. where chi x is an arbitrary function, okay? So this is a gauge transformation, and out of this transformation you get that E prime is equal E, and B prime is equal B. I imagine you have done this in electromagnetic things, and I don't want to um, change, I don't want to spend further time. Now, as it is, the gauge field are invariant. What we want is that also the klein gordon equation must be invariant. If the minimal coupling uh, is uh, used, um, we could have used another coupling and other things, but what we want is that if the observable are invariant at the classical level, uh, the invariance must remain also at the quantum level. Now, does this happen? <coughs> so let's change, uh, let's change, uh, let me take, okay, let me write. Now, let's uh, write with the metric so that we have everything down. Rewrite the klein gordon equation in the minimal coupling scheme. And that's a, this is the gauge transform variable. Now, this equation does not seem to be invariant because what happened is that the um, gauge field has changed but nothing else. So this is not the one as before because before there was I, particularly if you go and replace I with the expression, you get G mu nu I H D D X nu minus E C A nu minus E C D chi D X nu I H bar D D X mu minus E C A mu minus E C D chi D X mu psi minus M zero C square psi equals zero. Okay, and you see that the equation this one the previous one, the one without gauge field, that only this part, now there is this extra part, so it does not seem to be invariant. 
which is the way out. The way out is that under a gauge transformation, also the wave function change. And if you change the wave function in this manner, exponential minus i e h c chi of x times c of x, then if you insert there this expression, then you go back to the to the formal normal equation. Okay, why? Because you see, if you do this in the book, I think is wrong. The book, the book, he says uh, there is a plus here, but uh, there is a minus. I think is a mistake. Um, so if you if this is the new equation, and uh, you change also psi. You see that uh, <coughs> what happened if you change psi in this manner, you have this derivative that acts on this and breaks down a, a piece that cancels exactly this, and the same for this one. Okay, so under a gauge transformation, we have to transform the gauge potential in this manner, but we have to uh, change also the wave function in this manner. Then the equation remains invariant because if you now plug it in that things, so what you get is exactly this equation. This equation that has the old gauge field and the old psi. This uh, equation, this one, if you want, can be written in a compact form is this manner, ih d dx nu minus e c a prime nu ih d dx nu minus e c a prime mu psi prime minus m zero c square psi prime equals zero. So you see that this one, this equation, and this equation have the same form. That means they are invariant in form. What we have changed is the gauge potential and the psi, but they are not invariant in form if I don't change the wave function. If I do the following, this equation and that equation are not the same. There is this extra piece, so they are not invariant in form. So what you have to do is you have to change also the wave function in which manner you change the wave function in this manner. So this is uh, how the wave function change under a gauge transformation. If you do that, then this equation becomes, uh, it has this form, but it is basically equal to this means do the calculation, insert, and this extra piece get cancelled by the phase of the wave function. So this is very important. In the book, there is some, I think, misunderstanding or mistakes in sign. Okay. So you see that uh, the minimal, because we use the minimal coupling, we had to change, to, in order to have gauge invariance, we have to change the wave function in this manner. And you see, the fact that the wave function under a gauge transformation change by um, uh, a phase is a very important uh, effect that is being measured. Uh, most of you have heard about the Bomaranov effect, okay? So the fact that under a gauge transformation, the wave function change by a phase is being experimentally detected. And um, <coughs> you see, it change in this manner by a phase because we use the minimal coupling. If we had used another form of coupling, the wave function in order for the equation to be invariant had to change in another manner. Instead, it changed in this manner. Is everything clear? I'm asking because, I mean, this time is not enough to follow the book. So remember, with respect to the book, uh, I have a different sign here. I have a minus. And this minus is crucial so that this equation becomes basically once you insert the psi with this form, uh, work out the phases, uh, then these things cancel and you get back to this, okay? Now, <clears throat> another, uh, that is, this is the last thing, is well, is it possible with uh, the Klein-Gordon, uh, if we have, uh, for example, an electric field uh, to do, um, 
you know, usually when you have a, a, an electric field and an electric field generated by a central potential, you can do separation of variable, at least in the Schrodinger equation. There is anything analog here? Yes, there is something completely analog here. So now we can <coughs> start this small chapter that we will call central potential. And the separation of variable is in R and in the angular part, okay, radial and angular part. Now, <coughs> it's very easy to see how to do. It's really completely analog to the Schrodinger case. Okay, so <clears throat> let's suppose we have our usual A0, and let's suppose the potential, the electrostatic potential, is um, the one that gives the electric field uh, is uh, central, so it depends only on A. And let's take the case in which A is zero, so that we don't have any magnetic uh, field. Um, then the equation of motion is the following. The Klein-Gordon equation is the following. And let's choose now a stationary solution. That means we are going to choose, uh, so this is an answer we make, uh, a solution that depends where the time and the space part are separated. So like we did in the Schrodinger case. So this is a stationary solution. So it is at a fixed energy, and there are not uh, <coughs> interference of waves with different energies. There is just one energy. Now, if you insert this expression here, the derivative respect to t brings down an e, and the result here, this one, is v of r. And what you get is e minus v of r squared. Then you have this that acts only on this part and left over, it, left, it, it leaves uh, this uh, part. And then what you get is bring on the left hand side m0 c square c4. There is some problem with the c again here. No, it's okay, I multiply by h square c square. Laplacian on C of R equals zero. Okay, so this is only on the space part of the wave function. This is the, if you want, this is what uh, people call the time independent or stationary Klein Gordon equation. Okay, <clears throat> now let's go into. And we have to solve this equation. Uh, we have the fact that the potential depends only on R. So let's uh, move to from Cartesian coordinate to polar coordinate, R theta m phi. Okay. <clears throat> and then if we use polar coordinate, we can write this uh, Laplacian in the form you know. And uh, the result is so basically I am, and then I take this and bring on the right hand side. So the net result of this 
especially in right in this part in polar coordinate is the following h square c square 1 over r square ddr r square ddr plus 1 over r square sin theta d d theta sin theta d d theta plus 1 over r square sin theta d d phi all this upside applied on c of r theta and phi equal equal now I bring this part on the left hand side and I get E minus V of R square minus M square C square okay so when I said that this part depends only I should have said here X Y Z x, y, z, okay, this one, psi of r, theta, and phi, okay, so basically I've rewritten this in polar coordinate, is the first piece, I have um, changed the sign here, well, uh, you know, it has a particular form, the Laplacian, this part it has a particular form with a minus then I bring this on the other side but there are some minus that compensate and the result is this okay now let's separate let's say I look for solution of this form first I look for solution that were stationary the space part and the time part were separated now in the uh, function that depends only on the space part I look for a solution of this form where the angular part is separated from the so I am looking for not a generic solution but a solution of this form and uh, now let's uh, do the various uh, so if I look for solution of this form let's see <coughs> what happened actually maybe a better way is the following instead of calling this psi of r let's call this u of r so I'm looking for solution in which the radial part and the space part is separated let me cancel here now and let's see if there is a part when you work out you, now you plug this into here and you plug all this into here and into here and work out the details like you did uh, with the Schrodinger equation if you don't remember just go and uh, um, see and then what you do beside plugging in divide by the same so you can divide uh, except in the region where there are zero this wave function for one over psi for one over psi so first plug it in do the calculation but divide by the wave function and also here divide by the wave function of course if I divide here by the wave function in an exam I said divide by the wave function and this fellow cancelled especially there he cancelled you cannot do that I mean one there is an operator so if you perform these things the, the net result is the following h square c square 1 over u ddr r square du dr plus r square e minus v of r square minus r square m0 c fourth equal equal minus 1 over y theta phi 1 over sine theta d d theta sine theta dy d theta plus 1 over y sine square theta d second over d phi square and you see that in this manner we have really separated the radial part 
the left hand side depends only on r, the right hand side depends only on the angular variable. So what I have done, <coughs> I have brought in this expression, but then this part that depends on r, I brought on the um, right hand side that had, well actually on the left hand side or vice versa. And so, so basically insert this expression, these answers, and then divide by one over psi. Third, separate, if you can, the part that depends only on R from the part that depends only on the angle. You can. So basically the separation of variable works, but you have various things to do. Uh, first is to insert, do the calculation, but you have also to divide by one over psi, the full function. And in fact, the fact that you have divided by one over psi, the sign is here. You see there is a y in the denominator, in the denominator, and here there is a u in the denominator. As this part depends only on r, so this part is a function of r, and this part is a function of t and phi, in order for them to be equal, they must be equal to a constant. <coughs> so basically, this one is a function of r, but it has to be equal to a function of t and b. So I say, well, look, this is a constant, and this must be the same constant, lambda. If you do that, then this single equation become two equations that are separated. They are not coupled one to the other. And uh, so basically put this equal to a constant lambda, put this equal to a constant lambda. The reason I can do that is because this equation tells me that a part that depends on R, on R is equal to a part that depends on the angles, and that cannot be unless they are constant, each of them, and uh, the same constant. So <coughs> do and write the first equation equal to that lambda, the second equation equal to that lambda. What you get is two equations, let me write them, h square, c square, 1 over r square, d dr, r square, du dr, plus e minus v of r, r square, minus m square, c square, minus lambda r square, times u equals 0. This is the first equation. What I have done, I have put it equal to lambda, but I have also multiplied by u. Because you see here there is u, u, but here there is no u. So I multiply by u, then I get a lambda multiplied by u. <coughs> and um, there is also an r square somewhere that pops up here. I take the r square away from here, and then it appears in the denominator. I hope he's right. Yeah, I hope he's right, but check at home the various r square, okay? And then this other part is equal to lambda, and this other part, again, what I do, I equal to lambda, but then I multiply by the denominator, this y, this function y, and the result I get is this, sine theta, d d theta, sine theta, dy theta phi, d theta plus 1 over sine square theta dy d phi square plus lambda y equals 0. But <coughs> uh, you see immediately that this part, yes? There is no R square here. Yeah, okay. Square. What? Square. This one square. Okay. So just, but check because for sure there are other mistakes, okay? Uh, <clears throat> what uh, my goal was to find out, to prove to you that it separates. Now, this part, this part is nothing else than the one or oh, the operator of the harmonic. Um, uh, the spherical harmonics. So if these are the spherical harmonics, you know what is this uh, lambda. This lambda, if you put h equal 1, is nothing else than the L plus L plus 1. 
okay? <clears throat> where L is an integer 0, 1, 2, 3, and so on and so forth. So I have determined which are the L. And then I plug it in this expression. The solution of these are the spherical harmonics. So the solution of these are the spherical harmonics that are labeled by two numbers. L and M, where L can be this, while M can go between L and minus L. Okay, so the solution of this equation is the spherical harmonics with lambda equal to this, just because the first term is the operator of the spherical harmonic. When you have this expression of lambda, not lambda now is not a generic number, is this particular number, you plug it in here and solve this equation for R. So this is the well-known separation of variable uh, things, and it works also for the klein um, uh, gordon equation. Okay. And, well, somehow, you know, it's not a miracle that it works because um, the klein gordon equation, after all, once you s is only the derivative with respect to t that is second uh, order with respect to the Schrodinger. The Laplacian with respect to the normal coordinate is the same. So, of course, everything works out as before. It's only the derivative with respect to t that is second order in the klein gordon All the rest is the same. Okay. <coughs> This you can find in the book. Huh? I am uh, skipping a lot in the chapter of the Klein Gordon. I don't work out all the examples that he does, pionic atom, uh, Klein Gordon in some strange potential. This is something that is useful for nuclear physics. So if uh, you ever do any course next year on just nuclear physics, then most probably um, the lecturer will uh, insert some of this potential, but that is not a our goal, our goal in relativistic quantum mechanics is to give as much as possible detail about the relativistic equation. And the relativistic equation, one is the klein gordon but we will not go into this detail uh, with 20 lectures where I don't uh, have the time and this is really not in the mainstream of the program. Now, one last thing before going to the Dirac equation is uh, the concept of uh, uh, pseudo-scalar field. Now, uh, when we did a, a Lorentz transformation that we will indicate from now on, with something like this. So we know, for example, the rotation, the boost, all the things that we wrote explicitly is basically a linear matrix made of constant coefficient that depends on V and C that multiply the other variable. Of course, we know that uh, the uh, klein gordon equation is Lorentz invariant just because uh, this things uh, is uh, a Lorentz invariant and this does not change, okay? So the klein gordon is invariant provided uh, uh, the um, wave function is a scalar, that means it transforms in this manner. And um, so this is a scalar. So if we assume that this change in this manner, that means it remains in the new wave function, in the new points, is the same as uh, uh, the old wave function in the old point that it means is a scalar, then this one is invariant, this is invariant, and the equation of motion is invariant. So the klein gordon equation is invariant if you assume that it's a scalar. But you see the equation is invariant also if you multiply by a factor, lambda, a constant factor. If you multiply by a constant factor, well, you see the constant, these remain invariant, the constant factor is getting out, and the new equation, this is a constant factor, the new equation is also z equal zero. So we could allow for a factor to multiply uh, this. Uh, well, of course, we don't want that the charge density change, and the charge density is related to psi modulo square. 
you know so this as we don't want that the charge uh, total charge change implies that the modulus of this is one okay so we can multiply by a constant complex number like any wave function of modulus one in this case it has to be of modulus one because we want that the charge the total charge that is plus minus e is not changed under a Lorentz transformation there is no reason a charge should change under a Lorentz transformation so for sure the, we have that the modulus of that is one now among the many <coughs> among the many uh, transformation of the Lorentz one uh, there is all a family we can change the velocity we can change the rotation and we develop all a family but there is also one that is the identity the identity is a particular kind this is a direct delta the identity is a particular kind of Lorentz transformation after all okay uh, because you see a Lorentz transformation preserves the distance the only things that we know the Lorentz transformation has to do is to preserve the distance is in four dimension modulus the minus one the analog of the rotation so the identity preserve the distance so the identity belongs to the Lorentz group now <clears throat> if under the identity we assume these things if under the identity we assume that this change in this manner if we do two times the identity we get back to the same wave function right so if we do two times the identity we go do this and then do again we end up in the same so lambda in this case lambda enter two times gets one well we knew that the model was already one now with the identity if you do two times we get back into the same things then lambda is this that means not only it had modulus one but is actually equal to plus and minus one sorry I uh, take it back uh, there is the identity that is important but there is also another transformation that leave the things invariant sorry I take it back I should have done a further step before so there is the identity and there is also the space reflection the space reflection is the following transformation x0 prime is equal to x0 and x i prime is equal x i prime is equal minus x i so this is the space reflection and this is the identity the now the space reflection does it belong to the um, Lorentz transformation yes because it preserves the four lamps so also these belong to the Lorentz group it preserves the four length okay now <coughs> let's see if we do this if we do a space reflection and we get the psi x with the lambda that has to have this form now let's do another time so basically we have done space reflection okay x prime and x space reflection now if you do another time space reflection you get the identity right so psi prime do another time space reflection lambda square psi prime psi double prime psi prime x prime but this yes you have done two times is the identity so is lambda square psi x equal psi x so I do two times the space reflection the first time I do the space reflection and I can get a coefficient that has modulus one because any Lorentz transformation can change the wave function by a constant coefficient 
Now let me do two times the space reflection. If you do two times the space reflection, you get back into the same wave function. But if you do two times, you have multiplied by lambda square. Okay, so I'm doing two times, and this one now gets back into this. But as I have done two times, this is the same as psi of x. That means from here, I derive lambda equal plus minus one. So under space reflection, the wave function can change in this manner, or it can change in this manner. Clear? Okay. So I repeat because it's a little bit uh, delicate at this point. The identity belongs to the Lorentz group because it preserves the four distance. Also, the space reflection belongs to the um, to the Lorentz group because it preserves the four distance. The four distance you have to do the square of this, so it doesn't matter. There is a minus sign here. Well, you can say, why you don't choose the four, uh, uh, reflecting all four variables? Let's uh, fix uh, on this, uh, just because what I'm doing is just um, um, aimed at some uh, consideration. So let's do the space reflection. We know that as it belongs to the Lorentz group, the wave function will change by a lambda. We know that that lambda from here has modulus one. Now let's do one space reflection, I get a lambda. Now let's do two times the space reflection. If I do two times, I get back into the identity because I have to do minus of minus and I get back to xi. So if I do two times, I have to multiply by two things, but I get back to the uh, original wave function. So I have that this one is with a lambda, okay, sorry. You understand the point, I'm doing two times. So I have lambda square, actually this is this. I do two times and I get lambda square, but I stay with the same psi. Then this one, I know that if I do two times, I have to get back on the same wave function. So I get back to the same wave function as I get back to the same identity, to the same, um, to the identity. So from here, you get that lambda not only modulus is one, but lambda square must be one. And that, Im that implies, so from here I derive that lambda square is equal one, so lambda is plus and minus one. So under a space reflection, the wave function can change in this manner. Now, those that change in this manner are called scalar, are called scalar field. They were already called scalars if they change in this manner, so it is consistent. This one that change with the minus is called pseudo-scalar. Now, if you, scalar is, um, and pseudo-scalar is related to the space reflection. It's not related to, so even if you change these, if you change, for example, x0 into minus x0 is still a Lorentz transformation. If you do two times, it's still the identity. But that does not define a pseudoscalar, or sometimes they say is a total pseudoscalar. Some book use this notation. Total pseudoscalar, it means it is a, um, uh, it change sign even when you change x0 into x0. Or otherwise, you can leave this invariant and just change a thing. But the generic notation is we call pseudoscalar those that change by a minus sign when you invert the space coordinate. Okay, this concludes what I wanted to do on the Klein Gordon. Uh, just uh, mm, look in the book because um, uh, this part, a small part, like one, two pages, but scattered along the chapter of the Klein Gordon. So I leave to you to find where they are. Just you write down the title pseudoscalar, and then you find you find out minimal coupling, and you find where it is. You write down as I did before separation of variable, and you find where it is. Okay, so okay, this concept of pseudoscalar is quite important because there are particles like the pi zero. 
that are spin zero, so it's described by the Klein Gordon, and also the pi minus and the pi plus. Uh, the other time we studied their charge parity, you remember, of this, the concept of charge parity of this. This time we studied the pseudoscalar. Well, all these are pseudoscalar. You can say why. Well, if you do the space reflection to be consistent with various decays that are present in nature, you have to give to this a pseudoscalar nature. Okay, so if you ask why, the answer for particle physics is always the experiment. The experiment tells you that this. Uh, I don't know if you have been informed that tomorrow in a Euler lecture room is one of these lecture room, one of the biggest one. Uh, the, tomorrow morning uh, at the quarter to nine, there will be broadcast of two seminars from CERN. You have heard about that? Okay. If you have time and you don't have any class, I advise you to come because there are these different kind of rumors. So some say that the discovery of the X will be announced. Some say that no, it will be a preliminary thing. But still, if they discover the X, and you know the X is a scalar particle, so now you have all the equipment. It means uh, uh, you can say in your life, if tomorrow they announce the discovery of the X, uh, well, you know, they discover the X just after I finish learning about the spin zero particle. And it would be the first spin zero, uh, you know, scalar particle um, that, um, I mean, plays really um, a fundamental role in the sense that is uh, while pi zero, pi plus, pi minus are composite particles, the pi zero is made of two quarks uh, and the quarks are combined to give a uh, spin zero. Okay, instead it seems, at least in the standard model, that the um, real fundamental not being made by other particles, spin zero particle, the only one in nature is the X. Uh, and um, Personally, I don't think I don't think it exists. But maybe tomorrow I will be. Uh, most probably, the bump they see in the cross section is due to some bound state, and so. On. Okay, now we start a chapter, please. Now we are going to the Dirac equation. If we, if you now want a spin one half particle. The equation is the Dirac one. Okay, first we will start formally, and only later on I will prove to you that it describes spin one half particle. But we will describe the Dirac particle. Now Dirac did not have in mind the Dirac equation. Now Dirac did not have in mind to describe a spin particle, but we will see at the end that the equation. Uh, that this equation describes a spin one half particle, but he did not have in mind that. He had in mind to write a first order equation in T, okay, uh, with a probability interpretation. For psi, you, we have seen that um, uh, in the Klein Gordon it was uh, it was second order in T and was that that uh, forbidden um, probability interpretation because if you remember the rho was done of a psi modulo square minus a chi modulo square so there was this minus sign and that it was not possible to give a probability interpretation. And it was because originally it was not in a first order formalism. Even in, when we brought into a first order formalism, um, uh, with that uh, two component formalism, still we did not have uh, a, posi a posi uh, probability interpretation for psi because the two components were phi and chi that combine in these strange things with this minus one. So Dirac wanted first order equation in T, uh, so that most probably it would have as a consequence a probability interpretation for the wave function. Second, 
Lorentz invariant or covariant. Well, if from the beginning he had first order in T, then to be Lorentz invariant, you have to be first order or sin X. Okay, because remember the Lorentz transformation mix T and X, and if it is first order in uh, X or in its derivative, it must be first order. Uh, in, in fact, the, look at the Klein Gordon. Don't look in that other second uh, formulation. In the first formulation, it was second order in T and second order in X. So uh, it must be first order in X and first order in X. So Dirac basically, that is what he wanted. And the result he got is he got an equation that describes spin one half particle. But we will get there in few lectures from now, OK? Have you already done some exercise with the person who does the tutorial? Not yet. What did you say? The tutorials are when? Like? Tent in this Friday. Okay. Uh, I think he will do some tutorial on the um, relativistic part, uh, relativistic uh, Lorentz transformation. And only later on, uh, there will be some tutorial on the Klein Gordon and on the Lorentz. Okay, so I leave to him the problems because I have a lot of material to cover. Now, uh, so that is what um, Dirac wanted. First order in T, Lorentz, okay, so these imply first order in X. So he. Uh, in order to have that, he wrote an equation, e x psi t equal h c i. And then he multiplied, he wanted first order. So he multiplied by some coefficient, alpha 1 d d x 1 plus alpha 2 alpha 2 d x 2 plus alpha 3 d d x 3. Psi. Oh, no, sorry. You can put a constant term. So let's put um, plus beta m0 c squared. You know, this is the most general first order equation that you can have. First order, since there is only the first derivative. Now, <clears throat> and the mass, because we have a particle with mass. Uh, this is the most general. And then he said, well, let's take more general as, as possible. Let's suppose that this alpha 1, alpha 2, alpha 3, and beta are matrices, and that this psi is a multi-component uh, vector. That means let's suppose that this uh, psi is a psi 1, psi 2, psi 3, blah, 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 psi n, and that alpha 1 or alpha i and beta i beta r square matrices uh, m by n. This is the most general first order equation that you can write. You can say, maybe I could put a coefficient uh, here also, yes, but you know, if you want to have the correct non-relativistic limit, you know that you have to end up in the Schrodinger equation, right? The Schrodinger equation has this form here. So let's keep that as in the Schrodinger equation. And let's have as much freedom as we can, but uh, not really uh, exaggerating. So basically, this is the most general form for a first order equation. Now, why uh, he wanted to be matrices, not only to be general, but let's say uh, this has to be Lorentz invariant. Inside the Lorentz group, there is the rotation group, right? The rotation group uh, acts only on the space part, and uh, it must leave this invariant, right? Let's take only the, uh, inside the Lorentz group, let's take the rotation invariant. Then this part must be invariant. But we know that the derivative with respect to x1 under a rotation goes into a combination of derivative in the other direction. The same this, the same this. 
Then, in order for this to invariant, the alpha 1 must change into the alpha 2, into the alpha 3, and so on and so forth. So that means these objects either are vector or, in general, they are um, matrices, OK? That means they, wrote, they are not numbers. If they were numbers, fixed numbers, then uh, this would not be rotation invariance, and so also not Lorentz invariance. So these are not just numbers. They must have another nature. And uh, Dirac suggested that they are matrices. Somehow, you know, it is like the following. Imagine the rotation. In the rotation, you have Lx, Ly, and Lz, the generator, right? And if you do a rotation, you know that Lx goes into Ly or Lz if you do a rotation. Don't look at them as operator. Look at them as vectors, OK? If you look at them as vectors, the three angular momentum. The angular momentum change under uh, rotation because it's a vector, so like all vectors, it change under uh, rotation. One goes into the other and into the other. But at the same time, we know that these in quantum mechanics are realized as matrices, OK? So anyhow, these cannot be fixed number. They have to rotate one into the other. So. So the other thing is that, you know, um, but OK, I think this, there are various, I mean, one has to be convinced um, why these uh, cannot be number, uh, because this is, has to be Lorentz invariant, so these have to rotate into each other, so they must have some structure. And Dirac made the hypothesis that the structure they have is that they are matrices. Now, <clears throat> if you... If they are matrices, what we can uh, do is, as these are matrices, uh, they have index, they have two index. So we can, uh, for example, and also these as an index, uh, one to n. So let's put an index sigma to indicate that there are many. This is a matrix acting on a vector. So we can put two index sigma tau. Also on beta, beta also is a matrix. So let's put two index sigma tau. And it will act on this column tau. OK, so this is the notation if you want to highlight the uh, matrix and index structure of your uh, things. And you know, all these, if you want to write in a form that is as similar as possible to the Schrodinger equation, because this first term is already as a multi component of a Schrodinger equation, then you can write all these as an Hamiltonian. Usually it's called Dirac Hamiltonian. I don't know why this guy uh, wrote F. In the book you find HF. F may be for fermions, he never explained. Usually this is called Dirac equation, Dirac Hamiltonian on Psi on Psi. Okay, so the Dirac Hamiltonian is this, is all this operator. All this operator, including this, is what is called Dirac Hamiltonian. Now, what uh, do we want? Because we have not specified alpha, we have not specified beta, and so on. So we want to find, is there any specific form of alpha and beta, or are they generic? Well, uh, what do we want? We want that, um, at least for the free waves, we want that the usual energy mass relation is satisfied. So we would like, uh, there are various things, let's write them here. What do we want? We want that somehow, out of that equation, if we plug in solution carrying energy and momentum, we want that this is satisfied. Second, we want that a continuity equation uh, exists. So that means we want that d rho dt is equal to the divergence of j continuity equation. Uh, the continuity equation, um, um, and you know, here we wanted the probability interpretation term. You want the probability interpretation. So there was already this requirement. And uh, the continuity equation, not only we want a continuity equation, we want also 
that the rho in that continuity equation has a probability interpretation, and, say, and the other is the Lorentz invariance. So continuity equation parse probability interpretation, and uh, uh, third, Lorentz invariance or covariance. What does it mean? Invariance, it means it remains the same. Uh, what does it mean, covariance? Covariance, it means uh, uh, it changed by a matrix that you can drop out. So, for example, if you have some vector equals zero, then that this equation is covariant, it means that under a Lorentz transformation, it changed in the following manner. Okay? but it has only a coefficient in from that is a matrix. Then in that case, you talk about covariance of your equation. But OK, so these are the requirements he uh, wanted on this equation. And let's see now what happened with this uh, requirement. Okay. In order to satisfy the first things, we want that if we apply the derivative two time, let's apply the derivative two times. So that means eh, eh, it becomes minus h squared, d psi sigma dt square, and we want that if we want that this is satisfied, then we want that this becomes minus h square c square lambda square plus m square c to the fourth on psi sigma. We want that that relation is satisfied, but that relation must be satisfied. If it is satisfied like that, it is satisfied also at the operatorial level. But at the operatorial level, it means you can apply a psi and get this and any psi. Here we have n psi because they make a multiplet. So uh, now the derivative two times with respect to minus h, the derivative two times with respect to t is e square. So basically, this is e square on psi sigma, and this is a p mu, p mu, no, p i, p i, c square plus m zero square c square psi sigma, okay? So you see, from this equation, we want that if we derive two times, we get this equation. Why we want to get this equation? Because this is the operatorial version of this, and uh, uh, if this is true, it also is operatorial version. Once you give the correspondence rule, must be true. Okay, so the requirement was this, but this implies this implies that also the operatorial version is true. The operatorial version uh, makes sense only if you apply to a wave function. So it means this. But this, what does it mean? This means this, because I take as E, as operator E, the minus I DDT, and as operator P, H, C, um, derivative with respect to XI, and so on. So you see this, that we want to hold, imply this. Okay, so <clears throat> let's stick to this. That is the first requirement Dirac wanted. This is a crucial point. Huh? He wanted that this equation satisfy this. Well, let's now start from this. Let's do two times the derivative. So, so this is what we want to achieve that each component, whatever is the equation that Dirac postulated, satisfy this because this is the um, mass energy relation. So let's do here, let's apply here IH DDT. Okay. 
Okay, so that I get two times the derivative. So let's see. I get minus h squared, the second derivative of c sigma dt equal. Then I have h c i alpha i d d x i plus beta m zero c squared. And then I have um, i h bar d c d sigma i h bar okay this one I've applied the time derivative I've applied the time derivative and it goes and that's on this the time derivative okay but now this one what do I do I take I this object, I know that the first order derivative is equal to this, so I replace this with the first order derivative that is this object. You understand what I've done? I've applied the first order derivative and I go on. Here I get second order derivative, then I get this piece, but here I don't get any more psi, but I get first order derivative. The first order derivative, if I look at this equation, is equal to this quantity, so insert Okay, you have to insert that things with the alpha and beta and so on and so forth. Let me cancel here for the moment, otherwise I don't know where to go and write. So you get a, a lot of now, so I take away the time derivative and replace with these things with alpha and beta. What you get is the following things. Minus h squared, the second derivative of psi respect to t. Let's take away the index for the moment of the component. Then I get, I have to be careful because here I call alpha i, here I apply, I get things but I will call the index j in order not to mix. And what you get, you get a lot of combination that are minus h square c square sum over i and j, alpha i, alpha j, plus alpha j, alpha i. Remember that they don't commute because in general they are metric. So I take these things divided by two. Then I have the second derivative of psi with respect to xi, with respect to xj, plus, plus h m0 c cube over i, sum from i from one to n, alpha i beta, plus beta alpha i, the psi dxi, plus, plus beta square m square c square psi. Okay, so basically I've inserted here this expression, calling this index not i but j, and then I have to do all the uh, product. If you do all the product, uh, you see, you get, you have to be careful because you get this expression. Okay. Now, we want that this equation, that is the second order equation, we want that this equation be this. Right? But if you want this equation to be this, uh, this coefficient have to satisfy some relation. Well, first of all, where the b square come from? The b square come from because when you take here, there is a term with b, b and b gives me uh, this. Then uh, you have b and alpha and you get these things. But you know, you get two times because you get the beta here multiplying the alpha there and then you have the beta here multiplying the alpha here. Okay, then why there there is uh, alpha mixed? Here is the alpha i, and it goes and multiplies the alpha j of these uh, things. But you have also then the alpha j of these multiplying these uh, things, okay? So you have two times uh, uh, the things. Okay, so it has to be this. So do as an homework, uh, Work out as an homework that one, okay? That means uh, 
So the homework is uh, start from the Dirac equation, impose this relation on each component, and see if you get this. Um, I can write down for you from the book. So if you want a more compact things, starting from equation two five on page one hundred. Derive the first equation on page 101. Derive the first equation that is on page 101, 101. Using the fact that each component must satisfy, no, 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 sorry, cancel, uh, just 101, stop it when I said 101, all the rest cancel. So start from 205, equation 205 on page 100, and derive equation 101, the first equation on page 101. Okay, now if you want that this object is this, if you want that this object is the Klein Gordon equation, there is no other way than the following one. This equation will become this. The first term is okay. But then we have the second term. And the second term, you see, these things is the Laplacian only if the alpha i, alpha j satisfy this relation alpha i alpha j plus alpha j alpha i equal to delta i j, but all these are matrices, so you have to multiply by the identity matrix in m by n. This is the identity matrix in m by n. And if you have this relation, then the two cancel the two, only the coefficient that are equal remain equal, and you get exactly this term. Then, on the right hand side, do we have first order derivative? No, so this must be zero. So the second condition is that alpha i beta plus beta alpha i is equal zero. The third is this, this is beta square times this must be equal to this. So we need that uh, beta square is equal to the identity. But it's the same, you see, if you take, um, take i equal j here, you get alpha i square plus alpha i square equal 2 times 1. So basically, you have also alpha i square is equal to identity. Okay, but this is already contained here. So the three relation, the three new relations are this. These are the condition for this strange equation to end up and be like the Klein Gordon equation if you do second order. Well, <clears throat> these are matrices, and you know, if i is equal from j, this is zero, right? And the same here, we have zero. So people say that alpha and beta matrices of the anti commute, what does it mean? It means that if they are different from each other, means the index are different, then this is zero, and so the anti-commute, right? The anti-commute because this is equal. So if i is different from j, what do I have? I have alpha i, alpha j, plus alpha j, alpha i, equals zero. But this means alpha i, alpha j, is equal minus alpha j, alpha i, so the anti-commute. Right? The same for beta. From this one, from this one, what do you get? From this one, 
you get alpha i beta plus beta alpha i equals zero, but this implies alpha i beta is equal minus beta alpha i. So both the alpha i and the beta with the alpha are anti-commuting, uh, are anti-commuting, but only if the index are different. So <coughs> when you hear the sentence, the alpha matrices of Dirac anti-commute, yes, when the index are different from each other. Now, I cancelled the equation. Uh, if you remember, I had minus i h t psi dt equal alpha i dd psi plus beta m uh, zero square c. Let me just get the right one. Okay. Right. Okay, now the alpha, this was what I called the Hamiltonian, the Dirac Hamiltonian. This has to be a mission. Okay, why? Because you want that the evolution is, is unitary. And so the operator, the tags must be Hermitian if you want that the evolution is unitary. So for this to be Hermitian, the alpha i has to be Hermitian because i, ddxi, is an Hermitian operator. So you want that alpha i are Hermitian. And the same for the beta. So these extra condition, we have to add them here. Let's add them here. Alpha i dagger equal alpha i, beta dagger equal beta. These are extra condition that guarantees the hermeticity of the H. And often I ask why the H in the Dirac equation has to be Hermitian. There can be, you know, one problem. Uh, I just give two problem uh, in the final exam. And one problem might but just be a set of simple questions, like why the Dirac equation has to be Hermitian? I mean, I want the physical reason why it has to be Hermitian. It has to be Hermitian because otherwise the evolution is not unitary, like in the Schrodinger case, okay? So it might be, I have not figured out yet. What I will do anyhow is the following. Um, even in the second set of homework, whatever is the number of problem, I will uh, give grades so that the sum is like uh, in the previous set of homework, 50. So that the two homework put together, those who, who got maximum grade 50 and 50 is 100, right? Uh, and the same I will do for the final exam. The final exam, each problem 50, so the total is 100, okay? In that manner, you know, the... Um, Homework uh, is only 30% of the final grade. For me, it's easier in that manner. I have 100 points from the homework, 50 and 50. You understand? So 30, getting 30% of that, it means I will give 30 points from the um, total amount you got. And the uh, final uh, exam, two problem, 50 pro points each, I will have 100 and I have to take 70% of that uh, for the final grade. You understand? So. Even if there are more than five problems in the second set of homework, uh, the total point uh, will be 50. I will uh, distribute the points so that this 50, you understand, okay? So it's easier because um, I don't want to make uh, mistakes. Okay, now <clears throat> let's see, now that we have this relation, let's see if we can, so these are the conditions that we have. Dirac started very general, but in order to satisfy many of the things, he ended up that his matrices, alpha and beta, 
of his first order equation, I have to satisfy this. Let's see if we can derive some extra things from this. Because, you know, now we want to get a specific form. And we will get a specific form. Well, uh, first of all, um, now we will prove uh, that uh, uh, these matrices have trace zero. This is easy. Well, let's start from the second one. Alpha, beta, plus, beta, alpha, e. Okay, we know that this is zero. Let's multiply on the left from beta. Beta, alpha, e, beta, plus beta square, alpha, e, equals zero. I've multiplied by the left for beta. This is one. So I have beta, alpha, e, beta, plus alpha e equals zero. Now let's take the trace. Trace of beta alpha e beta plus trace alpha e equals zero. Now uh, you know that the trace is cyclic. So this is equal to trace beta beta alpha e plus trace alpha e equals zero. But this means trace alpha e, this is the identity, plus trace alpha e is 0. So it means trace alpha e is equal minus trace alpha e. That means this must be 0. Note that this property does not uh, change if you do uh, if you transform the alpha. Let's suppose we transform the alpha in this manner: alpha, whatever is the alpha, u minus one. Now, if we take the trace of alpha prime, which is the trace of u alpha u minus one, and this is trace u minus one u alpha using the cyclic property of the trace. Okay, everybody is familiar with the cyclic property of the trace. Okay, and then uh, this cancel and you get trace alpha. So you see, even if you do a transformation <coughs> on the alpha, uh, you get, now let's see if the beta has trace zero. Let's start again from this. So I have proved that alpha have trace zero. So let's add them here, trace alpha e is zero. Now, <clears throat> let's multiply this relation by alpha to the minus one from the right. So alpha i beta, alpha i to the minus one plus beta, alpha i, alpha i to the minus 1 equals 0. This gives me 1. I have alpha i, beta, alpha minus 1 plus beta equals 0. Let's take the trace. I have alpha i, beta, alpha minus 1 plus trace beta equals 0. But this one, I use the cyclic property. It becomes alpha minus 1, alpha i, beta, plus trace beta equals zero. This goes away, and what you are left is trace beta plus trace beta equals zero. So trace beta equal minus trace beta. That means this is zero. So second property. These matrix have trace zero, or they are traceless, people say. Another thing, you see that the square is 1. When the square is 1, not the modulo square, the square is 1, it means the eigenvalue can only be plus or minus 1. Okay, that is very simple to prove. I leave you as, an, as a, in a, not one of the homework, but just a simple things. 
prove that if the square of a matrix is one, then the eigenvalue of this matrix are plus and minus one. But if the trace is zero, the trace of alpha is equal to the trace of beta and is zero. The eigenvalue are one and minus one. It can only happen if the dimension of this is even, right? It can only be one and minus one, the eigenvalue from this property. The trace is zero. That can only happen that summing one and minus one if it is even. So that means n, the dimension, is an even number. Now, <clears throat> uh, let's now go and choose the eigenvalue are uh, plus and minus one, the trace is zero, the dimension is even. So which is the smallest even dimension? Two. So let's start with n equal two. We are looking for matrices uh, that have trace uh, um, that satisfy that property, anti-commute into uh, the dev dimension two, the eigenvalue is one and minus one. The only one who do this are the three sigma matrices, sigma one, sigma two, and sigma three of Pauli. But these are three and I need four because uh, alpha i goes from one to three and beta, so I need four matrices, and I have only four, I have only three. So n equal two cannot be the right number. Next even number, next even number is n equal four. So n equal four is the smallest number that satisfy the, um, the all that set of condition. And which is the solution of that? Well. You know, remember that the sigma matrices, um, when the index are not the same, uh, exactly satisfy this. You know, uh, the anti-commute, the sigma matrix is anti-commute. Uh, so playing with the sigma matrix is actually easy to build the alpha in four dimension. The result is this, alpha is equal to sigma i sigma i, zero, zero, and beta is equal i, the identity, zero, zero, minus i. This is the smallest solution of the Dirac equation, not solution in the term of wave function, but in the term of the matrices. So these are called Dirac matrices. There are these and there are others, but you see you build them out of the Pauli matrices. If you want them written in, ex, uh, in an explicit form, we can do. So alpha one, we have to use the sigma one and it will be Zero 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 one one zero 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 one one zero. This is alpha one, alpha two, zero 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 minus i i zero zero minus i i zero and alpha three is <clears throat> zero, 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 one minus one, zero, zero, one minus one, zero, zero, and beta is zero, 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 one, zero, zero, one, zero, 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 minus one, zero, zero, minus one. Okay, so this is the smallest realization of the Dirac equation, and you can check that the anti-commute, that they have all this property, okay? We stop here.
Thursday we will go on with the Dirac equation and um, I don't know if we will have time to do higher spin equation, but the higher spin equation like uh, equation for spin two, spin three, al three half actually, spin one, spin three half and so on are things that you will uh, do in more detail when you do the um, uh, particle physics. So I think for this course we will um, get we will work out many details of the Dirac equation, but mm, we will not go to higher uh, spin equation, okay?